Welcome to the Wellness Real Estate Podcast, and today you are in for a treat because oftentimes this subject is something agents want to steer clear of because it can cause all sorts of problems in closings and is one of the major reasons new home buyers want to sue sellers after closing. So what am I talking about? You guessed it, mold. <laughs> Today's expert guest is Jason Earl, and he's a man on a mission. An adoring father of two boys in diapers, incurable entrepreneur, and indoor air quality crusader, he's the founder and CEO of Got Mold and the creator of the Got Mold Test Kit. The realization that his moldy childhood home was the underlying cause of his extreme allergies and asthma led him into the healthy home business in 2002, leaving behind a successful career on Wall Street. Over the last two decades, Jason has personally performed countless sick building investigations, solving many medical mysteries along the way, helping thousands of families recover their health and peace of mind. He's been featured or appeared in Good Morning America, Extreme Makeover, Home Edition, The Dr. Oz Show, Entrepreneur, Wired, and more. So today, we are going to discuss how big producing agents tackle mold issues that lead to successful closings and brand excellence. So whether you are a realtor or even a homeowner who's just come across this show, I guarantee you that there will be some new insights you get from this awesome interview I had with Jason Earl. You ready? Okay, let's grow. Welcome to the Wellness Real Estate Podcast, where you'll discover a groundbreaking strategy that is transforming real estate marketing. In every episode, we focus on topics that will help you have more authentic engagements and meaningful conversations about your business. As the wellness real estate impact grows with projections reaching 850 billion by 2027, don't miss this opportunity to revolutionize your approach, generate more leads and increase sales, becoming the community connector you're meant to be. I'm Sheila Alston, and I'm your host. I'm also the founder of Healthy Home Media, where I help agents all over the country leverage this new trend in the industry to spark new conversations that get people to listen to you and notice your brand. So if you're tired of spinning your wheels without the consistent leads to show for it, then stay tuned. This podcast is your guide to standing out in a rapidly evolving market guaranteed to change the way you think about real estate marketing. Hey, welcome to the Wellness Real Estate Podcast. Today, I'm so excited because I've got a great guest on the show today, Jason Earl. He's the founder of GotMold.com. Today, we're going to talk about how big producers tackle mold issues that lead to successful closings and brand excellence. So welcome. So good to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about your story. I mean, the sto- when I read about you, I was just like, Wow, this is so interesting. So maybe before we get started talking about the real estate stuff, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got into mold and share a little bit about your story with us. Sure, sure. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, You know, mold is one of those funny uh, careers that I don't think anybody really plans to go into. (laughs) Right. But 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 you land here usually from a personal experience, Um, and you know, this, this uh, phrase comes up um, in my mind a lot, which is no, no adversity should be wasted. And, um, and, and so many of the people that I know that are doing important work in this, in this space and in the health space in general um, had a personal experience that, you know, took them offline to some Mm -hmm. degree. And Mm -hmm. then the the solution is something that you just can't keep to yourself. So, um, so I'm no exception to that. So when I was about four years old, I, I suddenly lost a lot of weight in a three week period and my parents were, you know, um, justifiably concerned. So they took me to the pediatrician who said, you need to take him to the hospital. So mm-hmm. uh, we we ended up at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where the initial diagnosis, uh, based upon my family history and the symptoms that I pre- was presenting with, was uh, cystic fibrosis. Hmm. So back then, that was a death sentence. And it hit my father particularly hard because he had lost four of his cousins to CF before the age of 14. So he oh, saw wow. this, you know, up close and personal. And this was their very, you know, greatest concern, mm-hmm. uh, not having the benefits of genetic testing like we do today. So, um, and, and uh, so the the good news is here is I didn't have CF. I don't have CF. Yeah. Uh, a second opinion six weeks later um, confirmed that. In fact, what I did have was asthma compounded by pneumonia. And when they tested me for allergies, I was positive for every single thing that they tested me for. It's one of my formative memories being in like wow. this pap- papoose and with a, my back ex- exposed and all these antigens. And my my dad said I looked like a ladybug with my back all red and swollen with dots all over it. Wow. And um, so I essentially lived on inhalers until I was about 12. And then when we moved out of that musty 
farmhouse, mm -hmm. uh, all of my symptoms miraculously disappeared. Wow. And, you know, it was chalked up to uh, spontaneous adolescent remission, which <laughs> is a fancy term for we have no idea what the hell happened. <laughs> right. And and my grandfather had grown out of his asthma, too. So it was just really a non-event. You know, we, we I just moved on uh, uh, with the with my life and um, didn't think about it again until uh, after a career on Wall Street. Um, at which point I decided to go traveling. It was after the dot-com bubble burst and I was pretty disenchanted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went looking for something meaningful to do with my life. And while I was away, I was reading a story in the local newspapers. I had a lot of time on my hands. And I came across a story about a guy who had been uh, exposed to a significant amount of mold in the hotel where he was an employee. Incidentally, it was the largest mold problem in modern history uh, with a $55 million total remediation cost. Um, wow. It was a, the Hilton Kalia Tower in Oahu wow. on Waikiki Beach. Um, and for anyone who's ever seen the old postcards of Waikiki Beach, you'll recognize it in your yeah. memory as the one with the big rainbow on it. Um, yeah. so, um, so anyway, long story short, he had developed adult onset asthma at 40 something years old, mm -hmm. uh, as well as all these allergies that he never had before. Uh, so it was like my life in reverse, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a deja vu moment, if you will. And so I, I immediately, the light bulb went on and I called my dad from a payphone, which probably isn't there anymore, and asked him if he thought we had a mold problem. And he just laughed at me. He said, of course, we had mushrooms in the basement. Why do you ask? <laughs> and, you know, it's a typical 70s parent. Yeah. Uh, mold, mold, wipe it off. You know, you don't need yeah. a seatbelt. Just hop in the back of the pickup truck. You know, exactly. That was the way. <laughs> so, uh, but in, it, it was literally in that moment, people talk about like these white light experiences or like these epiphanies they get or like suddenly like life opens up and suddenly there's clarity. I had this immediate fascination with uh, not mold per se, although it is fascinating. And the more I learned mm -hmm. about it, the more amazing it is. Um, what I really became pa passionate about or fascinated by is the idea that the buildings that we live and work in can make you sick. Mm -hmm. That to me was such a profound, big idea um, because it was hiding in plain sight, mm -hmm. probably affecting, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. Um, and Largely preventable because if it's dampness driven, boy, that means that we're doing something wrong, right? We mm -hmm. live on a water planet. <laughs> yeah. We don't know how to manage moisture by now, boy, you know, like what have we been doing this whole time? And so, so that propelled me to come back to New Jersey armed with a lot of curiosity and again, time on my hands. And I ended up um, taking a job on the repair and remediation side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I went from Wall Street to basically contracting. And uh, on the sales side, and it was it was a lot of fun. But I quickly learned that the contractors were 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 not doing such great work. Um, often using chemicals instead of cleaning, and many times leaving the homes worse than mm -hmm. they found them, while charging you know outrageous sums to, for mm -hmm. the for the benefit um, or lack thereof. So uh, so I then decided that there was probably more opportunity for me to both learn and also serve through the inspection side of the business. And, um, so I was taking a lot of, a lot, a lot of, uh, college courses on building science and things like that, like non-credit stuff just to get, get up to speed doing a lot of reading. And that's when I discovered the, the, the most amazing tool, which was mold sniffing dogs. Um, mm. and, uh, it turns out that that's where I got my best education. Oreo, my famed mold dog who propelled us into, you know, gosh, I, I don't even know how many TV shows, magazines, newspapers, books on working dogs, college biology textbooks. I mean, I've, I've got wow. boxes and boxes of them, but she taught me where mold hides. Um, and she was also a great calling card. So it, it, in terms of the diagnostic side, she literally could go into a building and within five minutes, she, she would have the whole thing scoped out. She'd tell me exactly where to look, where to dig in deeper, where to take samples. And so I quickly learned, uh, largely driven by the press we had, you know, I was busy for so long, that um, buildings fail in a kind of predictive manner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the defects, at least in our regional basis, are pretty similar as the building's age. And, um, and so she essentially taught me how to inspect for mold. Um, and so that, that company became 1-800-GOT-MOLD. Um, and, uh, we did that for eight, I did that in the field for 18 years her, with her 12 years, actually, mm -hmm. she, she did thousands of inspections with me. And then in recent years, I became frustrated by the fact that people couldn't afford our services often. Um, mm -hmm. and that we were limit, limited to our geography, which led us to create the got -Mold test kit, uh, which is what, what occupies my time and focus today. Wow, that's so exciting. And just to know that you were so inspired to heal others because you were healed by getting out of that environment. And it could be just as easy as just not being in that 
area where there's mold that you can, your body then starts to have the ability to heal itself. That's right. I love that. Yeah. And actually, you know, the, 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 the sort of beautiful bookend on this Mm -hmm. is that I became fascinated by the idea that buildings can make you sick. That was the sort of, you know, that was the gateway drug for me. Uh, and, and the, 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 the incredible myriad of disease states that are caused or aggravated by poor indoor air quality is just now starting to be understood. I intuitively understood that this was a big deal 20 years ago, and it was very much a you know, push market. I had to really educate people about this. Now it's a pull market, right? People, had the, the demand outstrips the supply uh, when it comes to Jason Earl and what we do. But uh, but what fascinates me now is not the buildings make people sick. B- buildings can make people sick because it's a kind of, I think, now in the in the zeitgeist. Um, what What's more fascinating to me is that um, healthy buildings mm-hmm. can actually help you heal and and can facilitate wellness on a broad basis. Uh, and so it's not just the disease states, it, it, it actually creates on the obverse, but actually when buildings are healthy, it liberates uh, the body and the mind and the family and the there's just so much happens there that can't necessarily be quantified. And uh, so that's why I'm really excited to chat with you today. Yeah, you know, because I think we're totally aligned on this. Last time we talked, I was um, telling you about how I talked with an agent about how um, when she was thinking about wellness real estate, she was thinking about mind the body connection and how she could just be more mindful in the way she attracts clients and things. And I was like, well, that's wonderful. But I think of the body or as the home as the body. And it was something that you had said too. And I was just like, wow, we're totally aligned in this because I really do feel like if you treat the home like um, an extension of yourself and you build a healthy home, you know, a lot of people don't have that connection. They don't realize that your home can be healthy, but if you just strive to make it healthier than it is, you are going to benefit. And so maybe you can explain what you think of, um, (laughs) how you think about that. Yeah. So um, I had this, this uh, fun kind of thought experiment that I like Mm -hmm. to walk people through, um, which is uh, first, most people think about buildings as these static boxes uh, that we live uh, and work in, uh, where we, you know, basically live and store our stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and more and more, I think about buildings as an extension of your immune system, like an exoskin or exoskeleton. And, you know, the building biologists who, you know, have a, have a, they're, 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 they're a growing force for good, I think, in this space. Uh, call it a third skin. Um, and so I, I, I like that idea. Um, but the the extension of the immune system is 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 a good way to kind of begin the conversation. But more and more, I think about the building as kind of a body. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, the, the if you look at it, it's got all the physical characteristics of an organism, which is basically, if you define it, a, an organism is a system of life-sustaining systems. Mm-hmm. And so if a building is in the system of life-sustaining systems, I don't know what is. Um, and so, so, but the anatomy of it is really pretty fascinating. Buildings have bones, right? Mm-hmm. They've got, you know, st- the structural elements, uh, they've got fat in the form of insulation, mm-hmm. uh, the dermis or skin. If you do a cross section of a building and you look at a wall assembly, my, that looks a lot like skin with the layers, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the under layers and the, and then, you know, the external and, um, you know, siding, what have you, uh, you got plumbing for the for the uh, uh, circulatory system and mm-hmm. the electrical system is the nervous system. And boy, it just plays all the way through. Um, and then, you know, there's this kind of like question mark around the immune system. And it struck me very squarely not too long ago that that's us. We yeah. are the immune system. In fact, we're more like the mitochondria, uh, more specifically in the sense that we're the, we're the sort of power cell that organizes all these things and kind of c- connects all the dots and makes sure that things run well. And you know this is true because a building that's unoccupied uh, degrades very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there's the building needs us. Um, you know, the built, moment a building's built, it begins to deteriorate, um, kind of like the moment you di- you're born, you're beginning to die. I mean, I guess, <laughs> but it's really kind of true. We're all on our way to the same place. And so unless it's lovingly cared for and maintained, it will, you know, it will accelerate. And so buildings have a birthday mm-hmm. and potentially a death day. And that longevity is largely determined by how well you care for it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, so a failure to maintain the building will, of course, accelerate the the demise. But when a building gets sick, 
and this is where, where, where you look at this thing is really a symbiotic relationship. When a building gets sick, it does so primarily when it begins to fail to shed wind and water and also to manage moisture in indoors or like to detox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it fails to be able to release the things that it needs to release. And so when that happens, the building gets sick. Um, and the, usually the first manifestation of that is a moisture problem because when it fails to shed wind or water or fails to manage the moisture indoors, mold will begin to grow. And I think about mold as inflammation in the mm -hmm. building, right? It's the first sign of pain. So you can think about that musty smell as a pain signal, mm -hmm. okay? It's your building telling you, hey, look over here. There's an imbalance. We need to do something about this. And if you ignore that pain signal, well, that pain signal, just like if you ignore pain in your body, chronic pain, chronic uh, inflammation uh, is its own disease. Mm -hmm. And so chronic inflammation in the building, chronic mold and moisture issues actually manifest as rot, which ultimately is a structural problem. And ultimately, I would argue, I would, I would assert that, that that's cancer for the building. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you keep going down that road, of course, a moisture problem can destroy a building. So so it's incumbent upon us. It's, 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 it's imperative, in fact, that we begin to look at these buildings um, in a, in a more, um, you know, sort of anthropomorphized, right. People love to name their cars and boats, but we don't do that yeah. with our homes, which is kind of a, a funny thing yet. We're so dependent on the buildings. And so, um, by, by, by looking at the building with a more sort of like love as maintenance or maintenance as love, mm -hmm. um, and then recognizing that when the building heals, so too do the people, or at least it allows for that to occur. Well, so people don't need to freak out about mold if they do have mold, there are some ways to mediate it, especially if they catch it early on. And so I'm assuming that that's what your self um, got mold test kits and enable people to do. Sure. Yeah. Our test kit is, uh, is part of a puzzle. Uh, it is, it is kind of our way of allowing concerned consumers to cost effectively take the first step without having to schedule appointments and deal with conflicts of interest and all the, you know, the, the potholes and pitfalls that are rampant in the mold space. I mean, um, you know, it's tough out there. You finding mm -hmm. a qualified person that, that actually has your best interest at heart. Um, it's, it's hard. It's rare. So we, with that knowledge, we created the gummel test kit. And so unless you take air samples using professional devices and, uh, and we partnered with the number one lab in the world who, um, uh, Eurofins who does our analysis. So, uh, we, we've created really the highest quality, low cost, uh, test kit, but that's only the testing part. So what we encourage people to do is actually become more intimately familiar with your building uh, or with buildings in general. And so the the idea is that testing really should be after you've done an inspection. So if a professional comes over, they do an inspection first. They don't just grab mm -hmm. samples, at least a qualified, a mm -hmm. reputable one. Does. And so what we like to do is actually encourage people to, to do the same thing with your own home. You know, give yourself, if you're, if your body you would say, give yourself a physical, you know, look in the mm -hmm. mirror. Do so you see anything? It's like a mole check. You know how people mm -hmm. to take a look for, for, you know, anomalies on their body. Same kind of thing. Do it, do a walkthrough. So we, we create an ebook, um, that gives people that step-by-step, -step, uh, guide to, uh, to, to, to do their own inspection so that, you know, every day we, we all come in and out of our house. We, we, we don't see so many things. We're so busy with, you know, our bills and our kids and whatever. Um, this is a moment to stop, pause and, and, and take a look at what you've invested in, you know, looking at the windows and the gutters and there's a, we, we've got all these checklists and stuff. And then after you've done that, you'll have a better idea, first of all, where the building might actually be failing because mold, mm -hmm. mold doesn't just happen. It's a moisture problem. Mm -hmm. Moisture problems don't just happen. There's something that occurred. There's a decay, a, a, you know, something has degraded or something failed or, um, you know, there's, there's, there's always an event, um, or a series of events that lead up to that. And so this gives you the opportunity to understand what that's about. And then, uh, collecting the samples from a more informed perspective, instead of just kind of like, you know, just kind of randomly doing it, <laughs> um, you know, wherever, you know, you happen to have your last sneeze. And so, um, so, so, the uh, the product that we offer here is really uh, a combination of tools, knowledge, and awareness. Mm -hmm. um, not just you know a, a, a 
But that being said, it also works really well by itself. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, if you, if you've got concerns, you've got a musty smell, history of water damage, symptoms that seem to get better when you leave the building or visible mold in an area and you're concerned it might be elsewhere. Um, if you hired a professional, they would do the same kind of samples that we allow you to do. Um, but without the concerns around, you know, scheduling appointments and conflicts of interest and costs and things like that. Well, so I imagine as an inspector, you worked with a lot of realtors. So maybe you can talk about a little bit about how success you saw successful realtors dealing with mold and unsuccessful realtors dealing with mold. Yeah, no, it was great when in the beginning because we had Oreo. Uh, you know, I did all I had to do was do these little demonstrations. You know, yeah. uh, everybody wanted to see a mold dog at work, so we had this yeah. really cool, cool training wheel that spun around on a lazy Susan with uh, dummy samples, and you know, in in five out of the six uh, holes, and then there's sixth one was a hot sample had mold in, it, and so Oreo would find it in two seconds and, and she'd yeah. do a treat, and everyone would wave and or everyone clap rather, and you know, yeah. she she loved it. Oreo actually got got bigger kick out of it than anybody. Yeah. Um, Cause I just got t- brought her around and did this all, this is all, all we did. That was all our, all of our marketing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we got invited a lot to real estate offices because they always had their, you know, lunch and learns and, you know, these kinds of educational things. So, uh, so we became very well known in the, in the uh, real estate community. And I saw a very consistent pattern, very consistent pattern, which was uh, small producers mm-hmm. were scared of us. Mm-hmm. Big producers loved us. Yeah. And and that was shocking to me until I did, you know, I was just, I remember driving down the road and going, ah, oh, I, I totally get it. You know, it's hard to find a prospect. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it's hard to get that prospect to actually like a property enough. And mm-hmm. and so, you know, so there's a lot of work involved in that. And boy, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to lose that commission. So so what I what I found was that the the small minded agents were the ones that would say, oh, it's just a little musty smell or <laughs> oh, just a little bit dehumidifier will fix it. Or, you know, just, just a little paint, a little kills, a little uh, mm-hmm. dry lock, you know, the, whatever, whatever kind of, you know, quick fix patch and not, not a big deal. Whereas the big producers would say, you smell that we're out of here, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they would just literally pull their client. This is not for you unless you yeah. want to make the investment, unless you want to go the distance on this thing. If there's something really great, it's right next to your kid's school and you want to fight that fight, understand that this is going to take a long time. It's going to be expensive. They would sell against the property yeah, because they didn't want the person to have a bad experience. They were concerned about their health and welfare, their mm-hmm. budget, their timelines. They were really, truly servant um uh, they, they had this consultative servant type approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and as a result, that authenticity seemed to really resonate. And so these are people that were doing 20, 30 million dollars and say, you know, they're really yeah. top, top producers in the Princeton market. And uh, they were never scared of mold. They were they were scared of missing the mold. Yes. Um, you know what I mean? They, yeah. They, the small ones wanted to hide it diminish it, uh, you know, uh, just ignore it if they could. Um, and, and, and that it's a huge difference and, Mm -hmm. and it showed up in their paychecks. It also showed up in, you know, the, uh, the word of mouth, Mm -hmm. you know, these big producers, they don't, they're not, they they didn't have to advertise. I mean, the ones that I'm talking about, Mm -hmm. people would talk about them, Mm -hmm. uh, and say, man, they, she really had my, or he really had my best interest at heart. So word to the wise, um, here, you know, if you want to be a big producer, you have to defend your clients, most important, most valuable, their, 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 their needs. Um, it's, if you think about the commission, um, you know, then you're missing the point. The money is a byproduct of doing great work. Yeah, I totally agree. Because if you put the client first and they know, and you're confident in your ability to find them the right home, not just the first home, you know, then that's going to shine through. You're going to not be seem desperate. Your energy is going to be so much better and they're going to know that you're looking out for them. And like you said, tell everybody about you. Absolutely. You can start as a non, you know, a low producing agent. You can turn into a high producing agent just by putting that foot forward and doing it that way instead. I've seen it over and over again. And it really is. It's it also people know when they bought a house that they got kind of uh, kind of slammed into, you know, um, they know because the, the, the home inspector, by the way, uh, and I hate to say this for all the realtors listening, but I always tell uh, people don't use the inspector that your realtor recommends. Mm. Don't because guess who that inspector works for? The realtor. Yeah. 
not for the customer. Yeah. They work for the person who gives them the repetitive, you know, repeat business. Mm -hmm. and, and very rarely, you know, you, you might get lucky and have a, you know, a, a repeat business, repeat business from. Well, a, and the intention someone. is from the realtor to have a smooth closing. So even if nothing is said, the inspector knows that, that they, everybody wants a smooth closing. The homeowner wants a smooth closing. They don't want all these bumps in the road, but if you know that like, if there is a bump in the road, hiding it is not going to be good for you in the long run. <laughs> no, it, it will bite you. And it, yeah. people intuitively know this stuff. They don't have, yeah. you know, it's not hard for them to figure out that when they have to deal with a mold issue three months into it um, or six months into it, that somebody dropped the ball. Yeah. Especially if it was diminished, especially if they're like, yeah, it's just a little musty smell, just throw a dehumidifier down there. Right. And then their well, kids are sick, you know? And what what about the seller's agent who took that listing and smelled this mold down in the basement? What do you say to them? I, I think it's the same kind of uh, thing. And this also comes down to, you know, in this day and age, it, back in the, back when I started doing this, it was so poorly understood. And it was, you know, you I had to really educate people around this stuff. Um, and so I, I, I kind of gave people more of a pass back then, mm -hmm. um, because, and listen, back when I was a kid, that, that smell was the basement smell. Yeah. It the was grandma's smell. basement smell. Yeah. It was dismissed as an aesthetic nuisance. And we now know that it's the first sign of mold growth, mm -hmm. uh, before you see anything visible, you will smell it usually is, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon ventilation. Um, but it's also a health hazard. Mm -hmm. Um, it is neurotoxic. Mm -hmm. Um, the animal studies done by jo Dr. John Bennett, at Rutgers university, uh, show that, that it is in fact, uh, some of the compounds in the musty smell are 40 times more toxic than toluene, which is highly carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in fact, uh, Brown university, uh, found a, a strong correlation between mold and dampness and doors and depression, um, back in, in 2018. And so uh, the the data from the animal studies uh, link the that musty smell to uh, a, a a a lack of dopamine production, believe it or not, in animal studies. So so it's it is a it is a big deal. In fact, those same fruit flies that were sickened by the musty smell also develop Parkinsonian like symptoms, mitochondrial disorders, all sorts of stuff. So so this is a big deal. It's not it's not just an aesthetic nuisance. So. Um, the sales, the seller's agent who smells that and doesn't take action, and I think is doing themselves and their seller a disservice because you have an opportunity when you smell and or see something like that mm -hmm. to fix that on your clock and on your nickel without mm -hmm. a gun to your head mm -hmm. and um, and patiently because everything it costs more when you have to do it fast. So. So get that stuff done beforehand. Mm -hmm. Get your testing done before you list. Um, that I, I strongly encourage that. I, I tried marketing that for a long time, but it's so un-American to be a pro, pro, uh, proactive. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> they think so, about the short term instead of the long term, don't they? Yeah. The I mean, term, human though. nature in the U.S. is just like, you know, we, we really, uh, we're like a bunch of toddlers. Um, you know, we just all worry about, you know, our candy Uh <laughs> right now, you know, exactly. Um, and so there's just no thought about dinner. Um, so the, the reality is, is that it is, um, this is a, this is a, uh, a subject where the adage, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think mm -hmm. that's what, that was written for this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in, in every way in terms of, you know, preventing it from happening in the first place, but then also preventing problems in, in real estate transactions by ignoring or dismissing these things. You know, this is something you want to run towards. And I might also say this, any mold problem that you have or that, that, that uh, one of your clients has that is, that is not dealt with uh, will only do one thing, get bigger. Bigger, because mold does one thing better than anything else. It grows and it grows mm -hmm. geometrically, logarithmically. So um, so one spore becomes 10,000, 10,000 becomes 10 million, 10 million becomes a billion. And so wow. you, you get this humongous growth and it happens very quickly. 24 to 48 hours is all it takes for mold to initially colonize. And so if you wait and you ignore it, what you're really doing is making sure that your client ends up having to pay more. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know that it's, it, it, it's a disservice to everybody involved. So at what point do you, do you, did you ever smell a home and go, okay, this, this home's like too far gone. It'll have to be like totaled here, like demolished or, or can you fix any situation? Uh, well, so it's, I, first of all, I've only actually told two homeowners mm -hmm. uh, that this was not a 
uh, that it was not livable and not salvageable. Mm -hmm. And these are extreme circumstances. If I showed you the pictures, you'd say people live there. Really? Oh, like, wow. you know, it was, it was shocking that there was actually, yeah. that there were inhabitants, honestly, mm -hmm. and that they were surviving. I mean, yeah. it was like squatter type of situation, yeah. courting and, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff that there were a lot of other variables. There yeah. That yeah. Healthy. Um, but I also have a personal experience having shopped for a house during the pandemic where, you know, inspections were really not even possible because mm -hmm. nobody was negotiating. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, so the and timelines were so short and houses were being sold, you know, instantly kind of. So we looked mm -hmm. at 40 houses while my wife was pregnant with our second kid. Oh and gosh. she was, I mean, she was like very pregnant. Yeah. And so it was, it was urgent that we get this thing locked down. And so, uh, and it, you know, she's very Midwestern and I'm very New York. So I'd walk up to, we'd walk up to a house, the front door would open and I go, nope, next. <laughs> and she'd go, no, you can't do that. You can't just do that. The she realtor's going to, you know, she try to try to calm me down. I said, no, yeah. honey, it's not, it's not anyone's best interest to waste time on these things. So yeah. if I smell and you're bringing that, a baby into the environment <laughs> and I know how long it takes to do these yeah. things and I know how hard it is to find the right contractors. And I know how long it takes to get the restoration done and a perfect remediation takes a month if everything goes perfectly. And that's not including restoration. So I, I wasn't about to move into a house and then move into a project like that. So right. I just was very, very cautious about about, uh, it, you know, there, there's got to be, there's got to be a house that's not musty here in Minnesota. Well, we looked at 40 and, and by the way, like 38 of them had a strong odor up here. Wow. It's terrible because of the way they, yeah. they build things and air exchange and six months of winter and all that stuff. So, um, but you know, I would never diagnose a building just by smell, um, except if I were buying the building. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, you know, like I, I, th they're, it just depends on people's appetite, right? So like I think about a mold problem, you might as well call it a fixer upper, mm -hmm. right? There's a problem with that house. Mm -hmm. It's not just a radon system that you're just gonna go drop a, a couple of pipes into the ground with a fan and then grab a couple samples and make sure it's below four pico curies and you're good, right? Mm -hmm. Like a mold problem has, it can be Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. So once you start opening the walls and next thing you know, you know, a lot of times it may not be straightforward as to what the source of the moisture is. Uh, and so, so once you start getting into opening up the walls, you start to realize, wow, this could really be a, a lot more expensive. And there's no way to really get your mind around the extent of a mold problem uh, in the middle of a real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons why it's so important that it's dealt with offline. It's dealt with outside of that, uh, that, that, uh, that those constraints, because it is truly one of those things where you just don't know what will happen. And sometimes it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's not. Um, and so the costs can't really be contained. And then, you know, we're trying to move or, or get right. a house prepared. It's just, it, 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 it's already hard enough <laughs> to, to buy a house, move, and do all that stuff without having to have, you know, major surgery, uh, you know, on a building and then the recovery time, which is, res which is what restoration really is. I wonder if homeowner's insurance covers that. Do Great they? question. Great question. Yeah. Uh, that's a hard no. And oh. yeah. And, and, and the reason for that is because there was a huge amount of lawsuits. I mean, a huge, uh, number of lawsuits, uh, that happened in the late nineties, early two thousands, um, because a woman named Melinda Ballard, who actually, uh, she and I became friends. She she sued Farmers Insurance uh, because of a major mold problem that they botched in her house, and her son mm -hmm. and her husband got se severely uh, debilitated. She sued. And she got a thirty four million dollar award, um, which was later returned. Um, but that thirty four million dollar award caused so much fraud. So many people said, "Well, I'm just going to sue my insurance company. I'm going to yeah. I'm going to get my house wet." It, it was ba basically a lottery ticket. So the insurance industry. Uh, w wised up to that very quickly. And they yeah. said, um, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And so they all got together and created a database where they, where they pool data on claims. And it's mm -hmm. called the Comprehensive Loss Underwriters Exchange, CLUE, uh, C-L-U-E. And they issue a CLUE report, which, by the way, this is a really powerful tip. Anyone who wants to buy a house, get yourself a CLUE report on the house that you're buying. Uh, it will give you the homeowner's insurance history. You'll find mm. out if there were fires, dog bites, um, any kind of claim that was made, even claims that weren't paid, um, claims that were attempted to will, will show up. And uh, so the insurance industry did this. It's kind of like the uh, assigned risk program for uh, for driving. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you don't just jump from one carrier to the other if you have too many points. They all know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. It's a share, yeah. you know, shared database. And so what happens is uh, the insurance industry said, we're not going to pay for microbial damage, uh, except for we'll cap it or five or $10,000 kind of as a courtesy, mm-hmm. uh, but we'll pay for water damage on mm-hmm. an unlimited basis. And so it's a semantic conversation uh, where, you know, water damage, as long as it's dealt with within 72 hours mm-hmm. is considered water damage. At the 72 hour mark, according to the industry standard and the insurance industry, 72 hours is when mold is a, is a, is a guarantee. And so mm-hmm. you then have to treat it like mold, which means men in moon suits, um, different protocols, different procedures. And that's where the insurance go, goes, nope, not mine. You didn't deal with it quickly enough. You didn't mitigate damages, which is a common term in insurance. Mm-hmm. You didn't take the, you didn't react to this quickly enough. So that's on your balance sheet. So very important that you don't rely on insurance. Insurance is there to cover a sudden and accidental losses, not uh, movement of groundwater through foundation, acts of God, um, uncontrolled dampness, um, and water damage that wasn't dealt with promptly. Those so things. So, if you are if you have a musty smell downstairs and you don't visibly see water damage, but then all of a sudden there is water damage that you notice on a heavy rain and it's seeping in through the walls, and then you call and say, "This is the first sign of water damage." Are they gonna? I wonder what they're gonna say about that. Well, they will often. Well, what happens is the insurance industry uh, has 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 got a pretty good. Um, they've done a pretty good job of educating their adjusters. I'd say yes. more so than the more so than the healthcare industry. I, I wish I wish the doctors knew as much as the adjusters do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they'll come over and they'll go, ah, okay, that's pre-existing. Oh, geez. So the, wow. the, it's just it, it is like so hard to hide that stuff. Uh, and and oftentimes and and even the attempt at filing a claim shows up as a claim. So the the real catch on this and the real sort of kick in the pants is that if you file the same kind of claim within a five year period, the insurance your underwriter will generally either drop you, jack up your rates, um, or uh, or or deny your renewal. Um, and so uh, you you have to be very careful about inviting the vampire into your home. OK, mm-hmm. unless if it, if it is something that you truly cannot pay, I always tell people, if you can pay for the water damage cash, do it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can and, and mold's going to be cash anyway. So mm-hmm. don't bother asking because they're going to count it against you and they're not going to pay you. So now you're double screwed. Right. Um, so so pay. You have to pay cash. Unfortunately, it's just there's no two ways about it. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why mold related illness is such a big deal, because it disproportionately affects people in low income housing and things like Mm -hmm. that, where they either are renting and don't have any control or B, they actually don't have the money to do the repairs and and remediation anyway. And so they end up living in this. And and then, of course, they can't think, they can't work, they can't do anything. So it perpetuates poverty. Um, And so it's a it's a it's a really serious problem here. The the fact that mold is mold and indoor air quality are cost prohibitive um, is uh, is is a major uh, dysfunction in this whole in this whole. Uh, so process. is it just an assumption that a newer home is going to be way better than an older home in all cases? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. I wish it were that easy. So what we have here is 130 million households in the United States okay? mm-hmm. and about uh, two thirds of them are, uh, are uh, uh, owned um, about a third are owner occupied. Um, and uh, so, but 75% of them are, are uh, sheetrock. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so if you were to look at the 25% that are plaster, mm-hmm. uh, you might say that those buildings actually has, have a better chance of not being moldy because plaster doesn't support fungal growth. The paint really? does. Yeah, the paint the paint can support a little bit. But sheetrock is like is like if you if you're mold, sheetrock is like is like, you know, a buffet. Um, it's exactly what it wants to eat and it holds moisture really well. The gypsum inside the white mm-hmm. um, the white uh, center Part of it is very absorptive and uh, it gets wet and stays wet longer than the mold takes to grow. Uh, so it's perfect. It's like, it's like mm-hmm. if we intentionally, dis- if we decided, you know what, we're going to build the most mold friendly buildings possible. We're going to build buildings that get moldy really quickly, just as an experiment. Mm-hmm. We would have exactly what we have. <laughs> really? Absolutely. There's oh no better recipe for building moldy buildings than the way we build 
our buildings today. Sheetrock, light frame construction, fiberglass insulation, fluffy stuff in the walls that gets absorbed, that again absorbs water, doesn't let it dry. We wrap the buildings in plastic, you know, Tyvek, or, you know, it's not mm -hmm. plastic per se, but in some climates we do, you know, low permeate, low permeability vapor uh, retarders. Um, and so, uh, anyway, the point is that we we really build buildings um, that are uh, chemical boxes mm -hmm. that get moldy very quickly when they get wet. And contrast this against the buildings that we built before World War II, which were uh, stone, brick, plaster, old growth timber, concrete, all that stuff. And back even when we had, you know, slate roofs and things like that, mm -hmm. or even back when we had cedar shake, you know, you could see if you went up into a cedar a roof assembly you could see daylight through the shingles mm -hmm. and if it were pouring down rain not a drop of water would get in but if water did come in because it was blown in it would dry very quickly now we build these buildings out of mold friendly materials mm -hmm. and we also tighten them up really <laughs> really tight for energy efficiency and then we slather the walls with carcinogenic petrochemicals uh i.e paints and polyurethane yeah. finishes and stuff like that and then we go gosh, why is there such a huge spike in asthma, allergies, autoimmune disease, cancers, and autism? What is going on? Yes. It must be in the water, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's in 130 million sing, uh, uh, residences, 75% of which are built like this. And so it is a major epidemic uh, that has been, I, I often say it's like the proverbial boiling frog. Uh, it started slowly at first in 1940, the advent of sheetrock and mass production, and then in 1970s when they closed the building super tight for energy efficiency, mm -hmm. and then even more more so now that because we went from spending 90% of our time indoors to 99% and always in the same building now, mm -hmm. COVID, uh, yeah. we're now stuck in the same building, breathing the same air. You know, so it is it is truly a we the the the, the it has reached a boiling point. You know, and, yeah. and it's showing up in our healthcare. It's showing up in our kids with ADHD, by the way. Uh, it's showing up in, you know, like I said, a hundred different autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's, it is manifesting in every single possible way you can imagine. Well, so then I'm, I'm hoping that there are solutions then to help these people that are living in homes like this, like just getting ERV or HRV system to bring in ventilation could be a first step, possibly yeah. changing your air filter, opening yes. your windows. All, 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 all of the above, right? So, uh, so the first thing you want to do is attune your senses, right? So mm -hmm. you, you want to really become, like I said, intimately familiar with your building and how how the building operates. And and this is not something you want to just kind of dismiss uh, and just you know, my husband takes care of that stuff, or mm -hmm. you know, my, you know, I just call the handyman. You really want to, if you can, get more familiar with this. You know, just like you're, you should be getting more familiar with your body. You only got one of them. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so you want to, if you see something, smell something or feel something, do something. So mostly it comes down to acting quickly. If you see evidence of moisture, if you smell a musty smell, if you have symptoms that suddenly pop up and they seem to get better when you leave the building, you take action on that, whether it means mm -hmm. hiring a professional or buying a test kit, uh, you know, those are the, the, the immediately taking action on that, finding the moisture problem, solving that. Now on an ongoing basis, you want to monitor your humidity. So mm -hmm. this means getting gauges you know, the digital humidity gauges, uh, which I have all over my house. Um, and what's cool now is a lot of them, you know, will, will report back to your phone so you can set alerts and things. And you want to keep the humidity in the Goldilocks range, which is between 40 and 60%, ideally 40, 45%. Um, and so monitoring that humidity is really important because it changes constantly. Um, and you want to do things like min minimize moisture through using ventilation and, you know, just the ventilation that you're building um, already probably has, which is like bathroom exhaust vents and, and use those things because the mm -hmm. moisture goes somewhere. And mm -hmm. if you don't tell it where to go, it's going to find a place to go that you don't know and you don't want. And so, so you want to be in charge of this and be proactive. And then, and then in the process of doing that, also recognize that every basement needs a dehumidifier, Yeah, every basement. Uh, and so you want to make sure that's set up so that it automatically drains. So you don't have to go down there. If you think you're really going to go down there and empty that mm -hmm. bucket every day, um, then you must have a lot more time on your hands than everyone I talk to. Yeah. Uh, so set it up so that it automatically drains. Yeah. Uh, and ERV is powerful, especially in buildings that are newer because in mm -hmm. ERVs, for those who aren't not familiar, are energy recovery ventilators and their their brethren or their, their cousin is uh, heat recovery ventilators. And they are, um, depending upon where you live in the, in the country, uh, ERVs or HRVs are, are uh, relevant. But there, there, there's some detail on there. Not every... 
uh, they're not all created equal. Um, and most HVAC contractors are just starting mm -hmm. to really understand how important they are. Um, and so what they do is they expel stale air and they bring in fresh air, but they, they use a, a transfer plate or a, a heat exchanger that basically transfers the heat energy from the home into the new air coming in so that you're not mm -hmm. just, you know, spewing it, spewing your, your utility bill into the, you know, great outdoors. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also your air conditioning, uh, will actually tra it'll transfer over, uh, that latent energy into the incoming air. And so the idea there is that, you know, you want to, you want to have fresh air. And since we don't open our windows anymore, Right. As a society, you know, we turn off the AC and turn on the heat. We turn off the heat, turn on the AC, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this allows for your home to uh, ex expel a lot of the um, man-made VOCs. Um, it doesn't do as good of a job of managing moisture, ERVs and HRVs. But what it does do is it gets rid of a lot of the really nasty chemicals that are abundant in our buildings, our personal care products, our cleaning products, our furniture you know, like it's just unbelievable. So we, 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 the fact that we still actually have buildings and furnishings and all these things that are made with carcinogenic materials, the mm -hmm. fact that that's even legal yeah. is to me like so appalling. Um, and you know, there's so many regulations about so many things that are absolutely meaningless and they can't like just ban that stuff. The right. Formaldehyde is a group right. one carcinogen and it's in all the pink and yellow insulation that's in these walls, right? Like it's mm -hmm. insanity. Um, so, so getting air exchange is great. Now here's the real, here's the best thing. People always ask me what the number one thing would be. If there's one thing, mm -hmm. open your windows. Yeah. You know, if the weather allows, if it's not too hot, too humid or too cold, open your windows whenever you can, because it's not just getting the humidity, uh, getting the, the fresh air in. You're also introducing microbes. You're bringing in spores. Mm. You now this may sound very, very counterintuitive, but mold spores are a natural and very important part of a healthy immune system, mm -hmm. a, a healthy microbiome. And so it, it, they are hormetic stressors. So if you go outside and you take a deep breath, you are breathing in hundreds, possibly thousands of spores without mm -hmm. any ill effect in most cases, unless you've got really serious sensitivities. And, and, uh, and so when we, when we, when mold grows indoors, those numbers often go through the roof. And so then it becomes too much. It's like the old, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, the dose makes the poison, mm -hmm. but, but you want to open the windows and bring that stuff in so that your, your building has a diverse microbiome. Um, and the data on this is very strong that homes with a high microbial diversity, meaning lots of critters, but none growing in your house have lower cases of asthma, allergies, and autoimmune disease. And the opposite is also true. Buildings that are over sanitized where there are too many HEPA vacuums, too many HEPA filters, too many, uh, sanitized, too many sanitized, just too clean. Um, those buildings have much, much higher incidences of asthma, allergies, uh, autoimmune disease, cancers, wow. autism, and things like that. And um, anybody who wants to read more about that, get Never Home Alone by uh, Rob Dunn. Fabulous book, very entertaining, very eye-opening. And um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. So we really want to bring more nature back in. Um, mm -hmm. We just want to control moisture so it doesn't grow in our home. That's the distinction. Right. So if you are a real estate agent and you're wanting to arm yourself with a really good, you know, mold inspector or um, just home inspector, how can they make sure that they're finding someone that could be a good partner for them to recommend? Well, that's a great question because home inspectors are generally totally unqualified for this. So mm -hmm. uh, they, in fact, they're not even allowed to. Most of the the, the organizations that train and certify uh, home inspectors have very clear guidelines around not allowing their inspectors to, to deal with mold mm -hmm. um, because it's such a, it's, there's so many potholes and pitfalls. So what you're going to want to look for, for a professional inspector is a, ideally somebody who is not in the remediation business. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, the last thing you want to do is bring someone in who's, who, who gets paid by the pound, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who essentially gets paid by the size of the job. Um, so an independent inspector, their business model is they get paid for their time and expertise. Um, and so a, a truly independent, qualified inspector, uh, somebody who might be a building biologist, this is mm -hmm. a, a really great distinction, um, somebody who might be accred accredited through uh, ACAC, uh, you can learn more, ACAC.org, um, where they have like certified indoor environmentalists. Um, mm -hmm. And these are council certified uh, credentials. 
they tend to be much better to work with than somebody who might be just a certified mold inspector, which is kind mm -hmm. of a hollow term. I mean, mm -hmm. you can, it's a three day course. Um, and you know, open, open book answer, open yeah. book test, that kind of thing. So, um, so you want to look for somebody who's independent, someone who's got, you know, uh, qualifications that, that exceed a standard mold, um, assessment, because you want to think more holistically around this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, um, you want to make sure that, that, that they're going to deliver a, a, a full written report, um, not just lab results. Um, because a lot of times they'll just, they'll just grab samples and send, send, send lab results. What you really need is someone who's going to give you a step-by-step, -step, um, broken down, they break down observations and recommendations, exactly what needs to be done. And if there's actually remediation that needs to be done, they will also provide you with a scope of work, which is what in some states where there's regulations that are required by those inspectors to provide to contractors. Contractors are not allowed to write their own scope of work in like the state of New York, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to have somebody who is, oh, by the way, of course, you know, it goes without saying that if you're in a state where there's licensing or requirements, you have to use someone who's licensed. Otherwise mm -hmm. you're just, you know, you're playing Russian roulette um, and it won't hold up in court anyway. Um, and so, uh, so the, the full written report will also have, you know, in that scope of work, we'll also have clearance criteria. In other words, when's the remediation going to be completed you know, like objective terms, you know, exactly mm -hmm. how we know when the, when the funds are going to be released, um, and a written interpretation of the lab results. So you need a real professional. I mean, our reports through 1-800-GOT-MOLD, uh, were 19 pages, no fluff. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, no fluff whatsoever. Um, so, so it's hard to find those people candidly. Uh, but it's important to have those people in your Rolodex mm -hmm. because um, because they're worth their weight in gold. They they will they, they whatever small amount of money you know they can be a couple a couple thousand bucks a few thousand bucks um, the amount of problems they will help prevent um, it definitely pays the freight. Well, and then what about the type of testing that is done? The air samples versus like testing a swab sample, which is better? Oh, good question. So first of all, so, so a lot of tests are. Um, prone to false positives mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, you know, I just mentioned that mold spores are so abundant in our, in our world. Um, I'll put a little, little point on that. Um, every year, kingdom fungi, which includes mushrooms as well as macro micro fungi like yeast and molds produce 50 megatons of spores every year. Um, 50 megatons is the equivalent to 500,000 blue whales. Just keep wow. in mind on that. Okay? Wow. It's 25 times as much tea as as what's drank every year by the entire planet okay it is wow. massive the number massive. of spores okay but most of them fall in you know the ocean and mountaintops and the great plains and you know so they're and they're essentially you know compost and uh, or and they're just lying in wait for the right conditions to grow so anyway uh we are all wash in spores in fact they find them 13.7 miles above the earth's surface in weather balloons and they help f form precipitation which ultimately leads to ice crystals and, and snow formation and all this stuff i mean spores are an important part of our weather system that's how wow. powerful that fungal force is on our planet so i say that all for a reason which is to say that if you swab any surface mm -hmm. you're gonna find mold spores mm. And so if you take a swab and then you do, you culture it, which is so 1999, because we now have DNA analysis, so mm -hmm. you don't need to culture anything these days. But but if you do what they do, which is a typical inspector move, is you swab the surface and then you send it in, you're always going to have a positive reading. The question yeah. is, what to what to what degree? Um, so I prefer to do um, a very robust visual inspection. Uh, followed by uh, very specific kinds of sampling. So uh, oftentimes, if there's a problem, I would request permission to drill into walls, which is not mm -hmm. usually granted, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but in in since we couldn't do that, I would make note of any moisture conditions that are present, you know, moisture meters and things like that, where at least we could say, you know, follow up on this, follow up on this. I'd flag these things for further investigation. Mm -hmm. And But then in terms of testing, grabbing air samples is super important um, because airborne mold spores are a dead giveaway that you got a mold problem not the only indicator sometimes it molds in a wall and you won't it won't show up as abnormal but in those cases you'll have the musty smell so it's again important to note that so so spore counts and musty smell are are are, are kind of two sides of the same coin uh, don't always coexist at mm -hmm. the same time so it's important to recognize that they're both indicators of the same problem essentially it's just the mm -hmm. location of where it's growing um, and then in terms of sampling for the surfaces, um, one of the things that's very common is ERMI, which is a dust test. Mm -hmm. uh, this is always high. So I would highly recommend that no one use that test because it's mm -hmm. absolutely problematic. 
Uh, and But yet it's very common that doctors recommend that sensitive patients use this test to determine whether the building is safe. Almost no building passes. Um, mm -hmm. Even brand new construction that's never had water damage will still end up with a higher ME score that's out, out of control. So swabs are no-go. They're junk science. Um, Petri dishes are no-go. They're always high. Junk science. Uh, not used by professionals. ERMI, junk science. Less junky, but the interpretation of it is is junk. So what do you do to surface sample? So if you have visible mold on a surface, what do you mm -hmm. do? Well, there's a fancy technique called a tape lift. And it literally is exactly what you think it is. It's a piece of tape. Mm -hmm. Now, it comes in different formats, but basically you grab a sample of the actual mold. And mm -hmm. at the lab, they can say if that's actually mold growth or if it's just spores or if it's something else. Sometimes it's dirt. Sometimes it's some other stain. So, so I usually use spore traps as the, for the air samples, mm -hmm. uh, which look like this, by the way, these little cylinders. That's what our test kit uses, by the way, yeah. or tape and tape lifts for surfaces. There's not a lot else that actually that that's valid, uh, in terms of testing, all the other stuff will be prone to false positives. Um, and so, uh, leading to complications in the real estate transaction. So if there's so many spores in the air, how is your air sensor sensing the mold that's, that's in question? Great question. Well, you, you asked some good ones. Um, so, so our process is not our process. I, 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 I learned a long time ago not to, to try to be too smart. Um, and said, what I do is I borrow from people that are a lot smarter than me. So on the methodology that, that, um, uh, that, uh, drives the use of this tool, which is the sport mm -hmm. trap that I hold in my hand for those of us not watching, um, uses um, something called volumetric air sampling, which means that we collect a volume of air uh, and it's a fixed volume for each sample. So mm -hmm. whether it's in the bedroom or the bathroom or whatever, it's always the same volume of air, 75 liters. But we also collect an outside air sample right before we begin the indoor samples. And why do we do that? Well, mold spores are so abundant outside mm -hmm. and also variable. So it depends on the time of day, how much moisture is outside. Did it just rain? You know, is it, is it, you know, what season it is? Is there snow on the ground rain? You know, it, there's so many variables. Um, and so those, what we find outside is what we hope to find essentially inside. In other words, mm -hmm. a healthy indoor environment looks a lot like the outdoor air. Okay. So, so what we do is we collect the outdoor air sample and then we collect the indoor air samples and our, our software audit compares the two. And then what we look for is essentially we delete what we find outside from what we find inside and whatever's left over. If there's a lot mm -hmm. of different stuff and higher quantities, that's a red flag. Yeah. Um, and depending upon how, how much greater and how, how much, uh, how, how, how many more species are found indoors. Um, that's the gradient that goes from like yellow to orange to red, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so that outdoor air sample is key. And so if anybody's doing sampling, which is why ERMI, by the way, doesn't work because it doesn't have an air, outdoor air sample. Uh, it's one of the reasons, um, if you have to always have that outdoor air sample, because that varies so much, uh, the types of molds and the quantities that are commonly found in buildings change dramatically as you go from, let's say Florida to Arkansas to Minnesota to Vancouver, the whole, there's a gradient there of different flora and things like that. And so this gives you the ability to know what's happening right now uh, at the time of sampling. That's wonderful. So then say someone gets a positive reading, how do they know how to hire the right remediation people that are going to fix it? Because like you said, there's some people that are not that knowledgeable doing remediation. And then well, there's some that understand what needs to be done. You you uh, <laughs> you hit hit the nail on the head, and I I you know if I wish I if I could wave a magic wand, um, it wouldn't be my first wish, but it would be my probably my top ten, uh, to to generate a list of reputable uh, contractors mm -hmm. because it's something that's been elusive to me for you know the last twenty three years. I, I've I have hired and fired fifty different contractors. Uh, uh, while while overseeing projects mm -hmm. over the last 23 years. So yeah. it is extremely difficult. And then it's not only that they're difficult to find, they don't maintain their uh, excellence uh, forever because oftentimes it's the foreman who's excellent, uh, not mm -hmm. the contractor themselves. And then they lose the foreman and or he goes and starts his own company mm -hmm. or she. Um, and so, uh, so, so what you want to look for is anybody who you, you want to look for contractors that follow very strictly and then advertise that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, the IICRC S520 mold remediation standard um, 
And the S520 is the only consensus accepted standard that exists. It is, um, it is extremely clear. Um, it is a rather dense document. So it's not, it's not for the fan. It's not for the, you know, for every man. Um, however, very few contractors follow it. Mm. And so they want to use, you know, fogs and paints and zappers and, you know, ozone and all the stuff. Um, mold remediation does not involve chemicals. So you also mm -hmm. want to ask, do you use chemicals during remediation? If they say yes, next, okay. um, because you can't negotiate with these guys. They will, they will even say yes. They'll even say no sometimes and then use them anyway. Um, so uh, you want to make sure uh, that they're not financially tied to your inspector. So the same kind of wisdom goes with, you know, I generally don't like it when an inspector says, I only use one contractor. It's only mm. one I can trust. And, and it may be true, um, but it's also, you know, suspicious. Um, and uh, you want to really, you know, look at things like, you know, Department of Consumer Affairs and Better Business Bureau and, you know, get referrals, get references from people and and follow up on them um, mm -hmm. because people will tell you if they've got screwed. Um, and, and, and people know if something went south because they will have paid a lot of money and they will still be sick. Um, yeah. and so, you know, so you want to make sure that, that those, the, the contractor that you decide to go with actually shows up when they fail, they all fail and on the clearance testing at the end, they all fail at some point. And so you'll also want to ask that with all the references. So did you, did they, did, did you do third-party testing? Uh, they have to agree to third-party testing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, uh, then you'll find out when you ask, did they show up, did they, did they pass or fail on the first time? And if they failed, did they show up promptly to fix it? That's a big deal. Um, because so many contractors just won't show up. They'll take their, mm -hmm. they'll take their 75% or whatever they already got paid and say, you know, sayonara. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it has to do with just, you know, sort of like being an informed consumer, but also being, being, you know, doing the things that nobody does, which is like follow up on references. You, you know. might need to start some sort of association or something that agent or inspectors and um, remediation companies can be a part of <laughs> to show that they're excellent. You know, we're working on that actually. We're working yeah. on a national referral network on gotmold.com yeah. um, that will, that will, people will have to test in mm -hmm. uh, for to knowledge verify. They'll have to agree to a code of ethics. Um, and then there'll be user feedback so that if customers are finding that they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they're not showing up after they fail, for example, right. um, you know, they get taken off the network. So there's a, you know, uh, so we're working on that. That's a, that's a big project. Oh my gosh. I love our conversation. I feel like we could just keep talking and I'm realizing that we've done it so far. We've, we've oh talked for an hour already, but I do want to maybe have you back on because we didn't even touch on sellers. Like, um, I mean, a little bit on sellers, but just how agents, um, if they want to grab listings, kind of what they can do. And then also I want to talk about your Gottmold Summit. Maybe you could yes. briefly talk about that. Yeah. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll shoot you over a link because uh, the page is being built right now. Um, so you can include that in your show notes. Okay. Um, so we're putting together uh, the Gottmold Virtual Summit, which is uh, about 30 top experts uh, on building science, indoor air quality, um, you know, Lyme disease even, because it's, it's, it's so closely related to mold related illness, so common that they mm -hmm. occur together. And uh, so our tagline is clearing the air on mold and mycotoxins mm -hmm. because there's so much mis uh, so much so much misunderstanding, so much confusion in the subject, um, even amongst quote unquote experts. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we got together the best experts in the world that actually don't have any products to sell. Many of them are university researchers, um, and they they truly don't have anything to sell. So it's amazing. I learned so much. Um, and, uh, and so that's really exciting. That's going to be launching at, uh, between September, uh, September 5th to the 8th. Um, and, uh, so we're really excited about that. We, uh, we're also, is it online? For, is it yeah, virtual? It's all virtual. Yeah. Um, and it will be, it, it will be at gotmoldsummit.com. Uh -huh. Um, so you can just awesome. put that in the show notes. The other thing oh, that, yeah. that I think is, uh, is really important for anyone who's, who's made it this far is we put a welcome page together for your listeners mm -hmm. at gotmold.com slash wellness real estate. And uh, if you go there, you'll see that there is a link to this show, which is mm -hmm. kind of fun. Uh, so uh, of course, if you listen to it already, you already know how to find it. But the, we also have our ebook, which I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, recording, uh, which is there for a free download. And there's also a coupon code, uh, which is WRE10. Uh, for anyone who wants to go straight to gotmold.com and, and buy a test kit, 
RE10 will give you 10% off. Um, but it's also there and you can click right through and that link is already embedded there. So yeah, uh, that might be a good gift for, you know, an agent who has knows someone who has a client with, uh, allergies or sensitivities or something, or maybe they should have one on their own so that they can use it to test homes that they're touring or, you know, that their clients are seriously interested in, or what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, it's one of the, one of the best use cases for the test kit is believe it or not, we, we have people giving them to, uh, expectant moms. Mm. Get a little peace of mind, you yeah, know. So yeah. it's kind of like useful for any mom who's expecting, um, would be or soon to be mom, um, because they're all worried about this, whether mm -hmm. there's a, an issue or not. And so, you know, whether you have a mold problem or not, you want to know. And so sometimes the best value of of, of our test kit is um, is the peace of mind. Mm -hmm. um, so most people don't really want to know, uh, you know. So there's a little bit of avoidance with this stuff. Yes. But but moms expect them moms want to know. Want yes. To know. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. I know what I'm going to have you on the show next time. We're going to talk about your um, working with wellness communities now and building mold like free homes or oh, mold. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm that's fine. About that's that. exciting. And that's, that is a really um, encouraging uh, trend. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that we've got these communities popping up. I mean, I I'm getting like an onslaught of interest just from having conversations like this yeah. uh, where people are coming to me, organizations and, and, and yeah. wellness communities coming. And it's fun to see that so many people are waking up to this and they're saying, you know, there's gotta be a better way. Mm -hmm. And, and they're starting to put these things in place and it's not just aspirational. It's not just for the, for the jet set. This is actually starting to become something that will be mainstream, I think in the next five years or so. So I'd Wonderful. love to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you so much. This is such a great conversation. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you learned something that will inspire you to think about your branding and how you can market yourself a little differently. If you enjoyed this episode, then you're going to love what I have for you because you don't need to wait to go get extra certifications or grow or expand your network to get started attracting new leads right now. You can simply begin by talking about wellness real estate trends and what you've learned on this podcast with others. I mean, this is an interesting topic that no one has heard about, and I have all the tools that can make it even easier for you. Wellness Real Estate Magazine is a brand new wellness lifestyle magazine, and it's the only magazine that brings health and home together. We educate readers on industry trends and how you can create a healthier home environment. Written by industry experts around the country, and we have three covers to choose from, Wellness RE, Healthy Home, and Wellness at Home, so you can easily find one that aligns with your unique brand and messaging. These magazines are the perfect done-for-you tools that help you not only stay top of mind, but help you be memorable. They also educate and engage your audience, which positions you as an industry expert. So differentiate yourself and grow your brand the easy way. Learn more at healthyhomemedia.com.